Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for uh, coming to our business and leaders luncheon. Um, Lynn Snodgrass would want this to be the BLT, but we can't come up with a T that works with luncheon, or the ones that did, we rejected. Um, so my name is Warner Allen. I'm a poor substitute for Lynn, who had to leave early and, and requested that I go ahead and kick this thing off. So um, obviously, these events um, can't take place without the sponsorship of some wonderful companies and people. And so I want to thank our presenting sponsors, Riverview Community Bank, Larry Schwartz, right over there. And uh, Portland General Electric, John Maloney. And thank you to our education sponsor, Gresham Barlow School District. Mike Schofield, is Mike here? No, he's not here. Ah, well, I've subbing for him is uh, Jim Schlachter. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you um, to our media sponsor, Metro East Community of Media, uh, Keith Thomas. And um, <laughs> flyers uh, listing replay times. Uh, for this luncheon are available on your or at the registration table. So if you want to review this again, uh, just check at the registration table as you go out and, and pick up one of the flyers and, and they're available. Um, I'd also like to recognize the elected officials here today. If uh, those folks could please stand and be recognized. Thank you all for your <laughs> continued service. And I'd like to recognize the uh, chamber board members here today, John Maloney with PGE. Uh, Mike's not here, and uh, oh, me. <laughs> and I had the great honor of uh, being the president this year, uh, and I'm with the Warren Allen Law Firm. We have three great topics today. Each deserves its own luncheon, um, but they all agreed to share today together, and each one of them will be on the November ballot. In Oregon, it's an October ballot with vote by mail. Um, the theme of today is we've got your back to school. Um, well, each speaker today will share their information and it will become clear to you um, why we came up with that theme. We've got your back is appropriate, whether in public safety, education choice, or safer school buildings. Our newly appointed Multnomah County Sheriff will be educating us on a proposal to take your vote away from elected uh, electing a sheriff and make it an appointed position. Uh, we have two speakers representing the same side of Measure 98, not to be mistaken with 97, uh, but from different perspectives. Uh, measure 98 is about schools and education opportunities leading to great paying jobs. And last but not least, Gresham Barlow Superintendent Jim Schlachter is here with the facts that we need to make a good decision about the Gresham Barlow School Bond. To introduce our guest today, please welcome the Chair of the Governmental Affairs Council, President of PGD, uh, PDG Construction, Brian Lessler. Easy for me to say. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Were that I was President of PGE, I would uh, be a much more highly paid individual. Um, in any event, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our guests today and our speakers. Uh, as Warner said, our first topic uh, relates to uh, a change in the county charter, making the sheriff's position an appointed position by the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners, rather than by uh, the current process of a open election. <clears throat> Sheriff Mike Reese is here today, uh, former Portland Police Chief, now Multnomah County Sheriff. Um, he has 800 employees, if you want to put it in simple business terms. Sheriff Reese is no stranger to difficult situations on the street or in his office, and he handles all situations professionally and timely. So why is he here? He's here because he does not want politics to influence his ability as sheriff to do his job. On the ballot in November, we are asked to decide to change the Multnomah County Sheriff position from an elected position to an appointed position. <clears throat> that seems to me to be taking away our right to choose by voting 
and sets up a situation where politics could trump public safety. I'm sure Sheriff Reeves will explain it further and better than I can. Please welcome Sheriff Mike Reese. Well, first, let me say thank you for letting me join you today. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of background on who your sheriff is, so you get a little bit of context for my remarks and get to know me a little bit, because I'm also on the ballot. Uh, you have an opportunity to uh, vote for a sheriff and also on that important measure, whether it should be elected versus appointed. So I grew up in Portland, uh, went to Roosevelt High School, and then uh, when I graduated, I went to Mount Hood Community College. And uh, after about a year of uh, college, I saved my parents lots of money and tuition by dropping out and joining a rock band. <laughs> so I thought I was gonna be the next Carlos Santana and uh, be the lead guitar player for a band. And when that didn't work out after a few years, I decided to go back to school and uh, went back to Mount Hood Community College and then Portland State, where I got a degree in psychology. When I graduated uh, from Portland State, I was hired by the Boys and Girls Clubs of Portland to be a counselor at the Lentz Boys and Girls Club, working with disadvantaged kids. And I learned uh, early in my professional career the value of our social service partners. The great work that we can do, whether it's in uh, addressing homelessness, or at the time we called them latchkey kids, but working with uh, children and their families from disadvantaged circumstances, really trying to change uh, their lives and give them uh, positive adult role models to look up to. Well, in, uh, I worked for the Boys and Girls Clubs for about uh, five and a half years and then made a, I was the director of the Lentz Boys and Girls Club and decided to make a career change. And I joined the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. And in 1989, I became a deputy sheriff and uh, Bob Skipper, who's here with us today, uh, was my boss and I learned very early in my career again from having a great role model uh, as a sheriff what it means to be a leader in a public safety organization. I want to thank Bob for uh, all of his mentoring and uh, the great work he did for the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. So how about a hand for Bob? So uh, at that time, the sheriff's office was at the forefront of community-based policing. And I was one of the deputies that worked in the Columbia Villa where we had a safety action team, which is a fairly novel concept back in uh, 1989, working with the community on public safety issues. We then worked in Rockwood and Carla uh, was my uh, boss there. She was a sergeant with the Gresham Police Department. And again, we were embedded in the community working on issues like gang violence and reducing the number of drug houses that were destroying the neighborhood livability. So uh, we had the Rockwood Safety Action Team and then David, D D David Douglas Safety Action Team. And in 1994, uh, because of annexations, they were transferring a lot of deputy sheriffs to the city of Portland, and I was one of those deputy sheriffs. So I became a Portland police officer and uh, rose up through the ranks. I w worked as a sergeant, a lieutenant, a captain, commander, uh, worked central precinct as the uh, precinct commander when we had a lot of issues around homelessness in downtown Portland, joined the board of transition projects so that I could work on those homeless issues with a provider, and spent eight years on the board of that organization, and they do great work providing homeless services to people living on the street and getting them into permanent housing. And then uh, in 2010, uh, a good friend and mentor, Rosie Sizer, was the chief of police, and uh, Rosie was fired in a budget dispute with our mayor. And I was named uh, the chief of police. It was a very tumultuous time in the police bureau's history. And we had uh, about four and a half years where I led the organization. And uh, there were a lot of struggles that we uh, had as an organization, as a community, around our ability to work with people in crisis, particularly folks that have uh, mental health challenges. And it's no surprise that we have a, a mental health system that some people call broken. I just think that uh, folks are doing their very best in this uh, challenging work and trying to provide uh, resources and services when it's just overwhelming uh, our ability to handle it. In uh, 2015, I retired and took a year off. 
my wife says I, I flunked retirement. <laughs> and uh, I came back as the interim uh, chair of the Citizens Crime Commission, and then uh, was asked to become the under sheriff. And on August 16th, I was appointed uh, the sheriff for Multnomah County. Now I am running. I am in the uh, unenviable position of being uh, running unopposed. So uh, it is a great feeling to have uh, that position. But I'll tell you, the challenge we have right now as a community is that uh, there is an opportunity for us to lose our elected sheriff. And it's so critical that we have a voice that represents you on public safety matters. And uh, the commissioner, commissioners and the chair, we all share a responsibility for public safety. But as the sheriff, I'm a professional. I grew up in a law enforcement organization. I know what public, good public safety looks like and how to provide the very best uh, service to you. And I think it's critically important that we have an elected official who is focused on those public safety matters. Certainly in the last year, we've seen across our region uh, how fragile public safety is. When we look at uh, issues like homelessness, we know that a lot of people are living on the streets of our uh, cities and our county, and that there aren't enough uh, shelter facilities and there's not enough permanent housing. And in some way, we have to balance that because uh, those folks living on the street can uh, sometimes, particularly when they get involved in large camps, create a public safety issue for us and a public health issue and a neighbor, neighborhood livability issue. And it's really important that our police and our deputy sheriffs are there to keep the peace, to uh, provide a sense of safety and security to everyone, and to answer the call when you want someone to come out and deal with some of these really challenging issues. So I see that my time is up, and what I wanted to do for the next few minutes is just hear from you what are the questions and concerns you have around public safety in Multnomah County. So thank you. Any questions? Question, do we have a microphone for questions? We, I think we have a few minutes that we carved out for any questions that you might have. need to use the microphone so that it can be recorded. Um. Can someone let me know who wants to ask? <laughs> Hi there. I just wanted to know, I mean, uh, the homelessness situation, what are your thoughts on a long-term solution? It just seems like it pops up and we just, in a way, move people around. What's the long-term idea? And I'll tell you, from a law enforcement perspective, uh, we're out there to keep the peace. We realize that there aren't enough shelter beds for everybody in our community that's homeless. And uh, when we've, the uh, chair and the commissioners have worked really well on uh, adding additional capacity, and as soon as we open up a facility, it's full. So we know that people want to get into housing, and we know that folks wanna uh, do everything they can to get off the street. So uh, adding additional capacity to our system is really important. But uh, there are some folks that, um, probably are uh, more focused on engaging in criminal behavior and are predators. They prey on other homeless people. And that's where law enforcement is really important in, in terms of protecting people who are homeless, protecting the most vulnerable in our community. Many of them have addiction issues and mental health challenges, and it's important that our police and our law enforcement are out there. When you call and you have a neighborhood uh, complaint or a concern about homelessness, a large camp that's grown up in your area, maybe it's along the Springwater Corridor or along another area. We have to have the ability as law enforcement providers to go out there, talk to people about what uh, being a good neighbor means. So if you're homeless, we're advocating that you engage in low impact camping if you can't get into a shelter. Uh, camp in small groups, two or three people. Uh, you can't erect structures because that makes it harder for us to police and it hides criminal uh, conduct sometimes. The other thing is if you're on private property, get the permission of the property owner to be there. And then last, pick up after yourself. Be a good neighbor. I had a question about SROs, student resource officers in the school. I know, I suspect you think they're as important as I do, but with you know, staffing issues, is that something that's a priority or 
you know, between the city and the counties that you're looking at? Because for our large high schools, we're really grateful to have them, but then you go down into the middle schools. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, I had a firsthand experience. I'll tell you, the school resource officers are invaluable. They're probably the front line of community policing with our children and protecting them, but also uh, developing positive relationships with kids and law enforcement, which pays dividends for generations to come. Uh, my daughters went to Wilson High School, and um, I was a basketball coach at Wilson for five years. I was um, down at the basketball tournament. Our varsity was playing at the state tournament in Eugene a couple years ago, and our, our women's team, when I got a call that uh, one of our school resource officers had been shot outside Wilson High School. He was shot by a man who was uh, there to kidnap one of our young girls. Uh, we found evidence inside his vehicle that indicated he'd been stalking kids. School resource officers had gotten uh, notice from parents and, and concerned students about this concerning behavior from a man in a van and uh, were out there uh, looking for them and looking for that man in the van, but also protecting our children. And I learned firsthand that day how valuable those officers are because uh, he nearly lost his life in protecting our children, and it meant the world to me that he was there that day. So they're a high priority. Well, again, I want to say thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to you about the Sheriff's Office and uh, address your public safety concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, our next topic deals with a ballot measure, Measure 98. This is not Measure 97, the gross receipts tax, which the chamber is opposing. That's a little political commentary. Uh, measure 98 is actually to establish and fund career technical education in all Oregon high schools. <clears throat> As a general contractor, I can tell you, to me, this is very important because we're seeing such a shortage of skilled resources in all sectors of the construction industry. We have two gentlemen here today uh, to talk about this measure, and I'm going to introduce both of them right now. Uh, first, Tim Nesbitt, uh, and then Randy uh, Carmoni, and they'll speak in that order. <clears throat> Tim Nesbitt has been involved in the political arena for many years, but don't hold that against him. His experience as chief of staff, member of the Education Investment Project, and on the Board of Higher Education uh, has him amply armed to help with another education initiative. He brings his experience as a small business owner as well. He owns an apple orchard in Independence, Oregon. Um, <clears throat> A writer, a public policy consultant, and a former labor leader in Oregon, um, please welcome advisor to the 198 uh, to the Measure 98 campaign, Tim Nesbitt. While you're here, I'm going to take just a moment also to introduce uh, Randy Carmoni here. Uh, and you might ask, why would Randy Carmoni be at the table today speaking about Measure 98? Well, the answer is children, school board member, um, probably the top two reasons. Uh, he, he is a business representative for the Elevator Constructors Local 23 Union. He's a school board member for Oregon Trail School District and co-owner of Echo Valley Ranch. <clears throat> he has served on the District Budget Committee and the Clackamas County 4-H Leaders Board. He has two children that attend Oregon Trail School. So please welcome also Randy Carmoni. It's all yours, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Like uh, <coughs> Sheriff Reese, I am not doing a very good job at uh, being retired, but I'm happy to be back on the campaign trail and in the political arena working on an issue which I think is very important to 
uh, the next generation of Oregon students and to our businesses and uh, civic leaders around the state because we do have a high school problem. And I appreciate the, both of the introductions clarifying we are not Measure 97. <laughs> We're not dependent on Measure 97. We are independent of Measure 97. We're focused on the best use of state resources to solve what has become a very persistent and troubling problem in Oregon, namely our low high school graduation rate. Uh, ballot Measure 98, this is kind of a vision test, both an eye test and a test of our own vision as citizens and voters. Uh, but Measure 98 is specific to committing state funds to um, the things we know will work in our high schools, career technical and college readiness programs and dropout prevention. Now the problem, and if you can see the print from where you're sitting, is that we have one of the lowest high school graduation rates in the country and we've had so. Uh, we've been in the bottom five of all states since we started getting good data that allowed us to compare state to state graduation rates in 2010. So for this whole decade, we've been in the bottom five of all states. And another problem, even those students who do graduate from high school, almost three quarters of them when they go on to community college need some kind of remediation. And that's not a good path to be on because it means more debt, it means lower levels of completion. So uh, we need to be looking at both ways to um, increase our graduation rate and improve the preparedness of our students for, for work and for college. Um, the <clears throat> there's a map of the states and you see Oregon was an outlier. We were actually uh, the last of all states just several years ago. We're now 47th. We're likely to be uh, 48th when the next numbers come out next month. So we're not making much progress. Uh, and that is a flow chart which is going to be hard to read again from where you're sitting but it basically looks at the class of 2006 how many went on to college? Only 76% earned a high school diploma seven years after high school. And only 6% had earned a two-year degree or credential, and 22% had earned a four-year degree. So what we find, though, is that our students are doing okay in eighth grade. Their math and reading scores are at or above national averages. It's just four years later when it comes to graduation that we find ourselves in the bottom of all states. If we were maintaining progress in high school, we'd be at or above the national average. So the problem is focused on high school and we believe the solutions are focused on high school. The, um, the path we're on is not very encouraging. From all the data we see, if we continue to fund schools at the current level uh, with the current uh, uh, rates of uh, progress, we'll still be below 80% uh, generation from now. So kids entering kindergarten this September one out of five is not likely to graduate with their class in the year 2029. So that's the path we're on. We need to change that. There are three ways to do that um, that we think have been well proven uh, among um, our school districts that have managed to get one-time funding from state or federal grants, but have often been challenged to continue the efforts they're making and the progress they're making when the money comes in the form of a grant, it's one time and it's not continued. Career technical education, uh, which have, the number of courses have been cut in half over the last uh, decade. Uh, and in fact, our students who are in career technical education programs graduated 15 points higher than those who do not take those courses. Early college credit courses, we've been innovating. A lot of our districts have found ways to co-enroll students in community college or get them college credit in high school, and those students are more likely to go to college, more likely to persist, more likely to earn a degree, and less likely to drop out with debt and no degree. And that, that's across the board for uh, all students in all income groups from all backgrounds, urban, rural, and all ethnicities. And finally, ninth grade, uh, our dropout prevention programs are focused on the ninth grade where it's, we pretty much know when students enter ninth grade, those who are at risk of not graduating. And so uh, with added support, some districts have pioneered these programs between eighth and ninth grade called summer academies or 8.5 programs, an extra two or two and a half weeks of preparation for ninth grade can help get those students back on track. Spending one on having a teacher's assistant, a mentor, or a counselor spending two periods a day one on one with those students can get them back on track by the end of ninth grade. That's an investment which will pay off across the uh, continuum in high school. So, what we've proposed here is a measure which would commit $800 per high school student on top of the $11,000 we're spending now for all students throughout K 12, but high school is more expensive. It needs these programs like CTE, which are more expensive programs because of the equipment and facilities costs, the smaller class sizes, that one-on-one -on -one attention that we need in ninth grade. 
But when we figured out what it would cost to uh, establish these programs in all of our high schools, get to scale what's working with what's now grant-funded programs, it came out at about $800 per high school student per year. Um, that is just one-sixth of the revenue growth we're experiencing from this budget period to the next. It's 1%, 1 percent, 1.4 percent to be exact, of what the total state budget will be in the next budget period. Very much on a par with the level of investment we made this year in full day kindergarten, which was also 1 percent of this year's budget. So with programs in the garden and a lot of success with third grade reading, we can't afford to continue having our kids drop off a cliff when it gets to eighth grade. We need to see them maintain progress in eighth grade. And the way to do that is to establish pr these programs, which we know are working, for expanding our career technical education programs and updating them so we can connect to employers and jobs in their communities. Uh, early college credit programs, and a lot of times these new CTE courses like FFA involve college credit. So students in FFA programs are now earning college credit for the ag school at OSU. So there's a very much of an upgraded approach now to career technical education. But the thing is, it gives students, especially boys, <coughs> access to hands-on learning opportunities and learning real-world skills. And, and that's what keeps them engaged. So when you look at these three programs, different districts will tailor their investments differently. But we'll be committing $800 per high school student to Randy's district, to Jim's district, to every district in the state to enable them to get these programs up to scale. and. Uh, um, sustain them in the future. The um, endorsements we've gotten to date include, uh, it's very gratifying to see uh, in this partisan environment, let me just click through here, this kind of list of endorsers. By the way, there are the, some who support Measure 97 and some who oppose Measure 97 who support us. But look, we have labor, we have business, we have other chambers of commerce. Uh, we have businesses like NTech, we have business associations like AOI, and we have communities of color coalition and, uh, and others who are all behind this measure because they realize this is the time to make this commitment, prioritize this investment, and get it to scale in all of our districts. With that, I'd like to let Randy tell you what the program would look like in, uh, in his district. Jim can add maybe in his remarks now or later how it would work with uh, the investments being made in Gresham Barlow. Uh, but we do uh, hope to get your support. There are endorsement cards on the table. Uh, you can sign up as individual endorsers or on behalf of your business, and we'd love to have your chamber's support as well. Thanks very much, Randy. Uh, good afternoon. I kind of have two uh, battling interests in this. Um, for a paying job, I work for the Elevator Constructors Local. I'm in charge of all the apprenticeship recruitment, and we hire apprentices to uh, fulfill our need. Um, us, along with the building trades in general, have a great need for people with hands-on skills. Um, they need to have a reasonable high school education with math and reading and the basics. But we are willing to take people with a high school education and train them on our dime to work at a living wage job, to uh, fulfill a need in the community to build the, the hands-on things that, that people need to live in, the buildings, the houses, um, the uh, mechanical stuff that, that has to be done locally that can't be shipped overseas. Um, and those are our living wage jobs. I graduated high school in 1982 and started building elevators. Never went to college. I make a really good living. My wife never had to work. And those same opportunities are here today for those people that uh, have the hands-on skills, can show up to work, um, and can build with their hands. Having said that, I'm also on the Oregon Trail School District Board of Education. Um, we built a new high school about four years ago with community support and the support of the school board. We made sure we included CT facilities, knowing that hopefully one day the, the budget would improve and we could increase what we currently were using at the time. Um, in 1982, when I graduated, we probably had twice as many opportunities, opportunities as we do now. Um, right now, we probably are at half capacity for our CTE program. Um, we got teachers that are teaching part-time just so we have the programs, and we don't even have all the programs that we have space available for. So uh, I have two kids that went through Sandy High School. They're graduated now and out, but I have a grandson in the school and, and I'm looking out for his interest in the future and the future of all the people in the district. Um, we need to provide the opportunities to keep those kids in school that have interests that aren't college. Um, there's a lot of the hands-on kids that wouldn't be in college if it wasn't for FFA. 
If it wasn't for the auto shop, if it wasn't for the mechanical program, we have placed people directly out of high school in local community uh, businesses that are within five miles of where the people grew up and live. So those opportunities are all available, but we need the funding to keep the programs going and make the programs whole and not just put a Band-Aid on them to keep them going until we get to that point. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions for Tim or I, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. So how do you intend to uh, manage the funding for, for the increased costs, uh, given the fact that there are so many budget restraints and constraints, um, and the fact that the legislature continues to underfund education? The measure is written to provide this funding on top of what the legislature commits to the state school fund. Uh, it's projected uh, that uh, with all the expenses calculated, the state school fund will need an increase of about 8% in the next biennium to maintain all the programs currently in effect. This will be over and above that. Revenues are up at least 9% going forward at the state level. And um, this is intended to create a dedicated funding stream that will continue from year to year rather than having these one-time grants come on again and off again. Uh, and therefore to make these opportunities available to all students and sustain the funding to keep it going. So this just come out of the general Yes, yes, the, the, the revenue growth projected in the next budget period over and above what we're collecting and spending now is $1.7 billion. So this is one-sixth of that amount. Uh, the, um, when you think of it, we have more people working in Oregon now than ever before. We have higher levels, we've had the highest levels of general fund tax collections we've ever had in Oregon. We'll have a budget of 21 billion in the next budget period, general funds and lottery funds, and this is just 1% of that amount. So one of our chief petitioners, Governor Kulangoski, who I used to serve as chief of staff, reminded me, Tim, there's always at least 1%, 1 to 2% of the budget in play in every budget period. It's a question of how do we get the best use to prioritize that amount of money to the best purposes, and in this instance, we think it's long overdue to provide the funding we need for our high schools for programs that we know work. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Chris Howitt, Gresham Barlow Board of Education. Hi, Chris. Um, hi how are you, Tim? Um, I had two questions, and I am in favor of this, but I also want to remind everyone that these are opportunities for all students. Uh, we encourage our our female students as well as our male students to take these classes, wonderful opportunity for all. Um, in reading the material, the explanatory statement, um, the first paragraph talks about being able to use it to establish or expand existing programs. But then I wasn't quite sure farther down where it talks about not being used to maintain current programs. So what's the, the, the slight disconnect there? The difference is that there? this money is intended to be spent to exactly that, expand or add to what you're doing now, not to backfill. So that language was written that way so that if you're currently supporting a program, you don't use these dollars to shift over to support that program and not expand the CTE or college credit programs. And one exception is if what you're doing is supported by a one-time grant and you lose that grant, then yes, these dollars can be used to keep that program going. And again, establish or expand means that you have an existing CTE program, perhaps a uh, auto shop program, and you want to add capacity. Uh, that part-time teacher becomes full-time. That's an expansion. You want to add a brand new program. That's an expansion. And you can use these funds for equipment and facilities as well as recruitment and training of teachers. So we know that the <clears throat> tax revenues in Oregon go up and down with the economy. Uh, right now we're going up, so this extra funds are coming in that are going to be mandated to be spent on this. What happens when the economy goes down and those funds aren't right. there? Uh, two answers to that question, short term and long term. Short term, we have a circuit breaker in the measure so that if we don't have at least $1.5 in new revenue in the next budget period, we prorate the $800 and phase it in over three years rather than in the first two years. So that's if we don't have the initial amount needed without, uh, if it's less than 1.5 billion, we just with confidence can't say it won't compete with funding for other programs. So we established that threshold. In the future, this is a statutory measure, not a constitutional measure, so it does not tie the hands of the legislature. And if these investments are not working, if we are in a downturn and school budgets have to be adjusted, these, uh, these investments are gonna have to compete with everything else. 
uh, in the rebalancing of the budget that occurs. We specifically did not want to uh, tie the hands of the legislature or presume that these fund this level of funding and this funding stream would be sacrosanct in the event of some worst case recessionary scenarios. Just follow up to that. So in, in the event that that does happen, then what is the difference between now, what the current status quo, and the event that we have a downturn and you're letting the legislature determine whether or not this is an important project or not? Well, currently we got a, one main funding stream plus a couple of small grant programs. This would add another funding stream to the state school fund. It would be um, committing to the principle that high schools are more expensive, successful uh, high school experiences costs more, we've lost that, we need to put a separate funding stream behind our high schools. It doesn't mean that that funding stream couldn't be adjusted in the future up or down based on how successful the programs are or what other competing budget priorities might arise. Through the legislature? Through the legislature, that's so, right. Okay, so, okay, got it, thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks very much. Well, as the old adage goes, last but not least, it's a pleasure to introduce my friend Jim Schlachter, uh, who really doesn't need any introduction as the superintendent of the Gresham Barlow School District uh, since 2010, I believe. And uh, he's here today to provide us with the uh, district facts that led to the school board um, putting a bond measure on the November ballot. Now, Jim can't legally campaign for or against the ballot measure, um, but he is here to do what he can, um, however, uh, and that is to provide us with the meat and potatoes of the bond issue. So please welcome Jim Schlachter. Thank you, Brian, and the Chamber for the opportunity to uh, be with you today, and, and it is certainly a privilege always to, to kind of get in front of a bunch of folks that uh, many of you I've uh, talked with extensively already about this, but look forward to doing that. I will tell you that we do have five board members in the room, and they can talk to you about how you should vote. Uh, so we have Kathy Ruthruff over here, John Hartsock, ra raise your hand back here, Chris Howitt, and then sitting together, Carla Peluso and Sharon Garner. So I appreciate them coming out, and they will certainly give you their opinion at some point. You know, it was interesting when I was listening to the, to the previous presentation, uh, I've provided some materials on your table, and I'm going to really lean on those heavily uh, as opposed to any PowerPoint. But if you look back on one of the sheets, it talks about the 2000 construction bond. That's the last bond that was passed by the Gresham Bartle School District. Innovation, CTE, in dealing with the issues that face us today was really the focus of that bond. And in the 16 years that have transpired since those successful projects, we have the Center for Advanced Learning, which is a state lead in CTE education and a model for how it needs to get done. This community did invest, and we continue to reap the benefits of the last bond, not to mention Springwater Trail High School, which was built in an effort to help those kids who in ninth grade are credit deficient to get a, catch them right out of eighth grade and put them into a unique environment that's expensive to operate but highly successful. So those things do work, and we have that experience. Our issue now is that we have 18 schools that are really, as facilities, aging out and in great need of work. But before I go into that, I want to mention just a little about who we are as a district. We were consolidated back in 1994, and so really most of our buildings, this district in a sense inherited from four different districts in the state with their own kinds of fiscal plans on how to keep those buildings up to speed. But now we have all of them in one basket to move forward, and so that's a lot to do. But during that time, we've had a great deal of success, and I won't go into a lot of detail, it's on the paper, but while it is true, Oregon has lagged in graduation rates 
when you compare our three high schools to the state of Oregon, we not only surpass, but have exceeded in the rate of growth of graduation over the last five years by double digits. 14, 16, and 20% increases in graduation rates over the last five years. So we are getting the job done inside of our buildings. The question is, how do we keep that going? How can our buildings continue to provide the environments that, that we need? So let me touch first on the process. Seems like three years ago to me, but actually in June 2015, we launched into a process of getting a lot of community members together on a bond development committee. A number of you are in this room that went to endless meetings where we really broke every aspect of our long range plan down and determined what is the best way forward. Is it a bond that we put in front of voters? Our board looked at a year's worth of work and said, you know, we think we're close, but let's get more input. So we went back out to the community last spring. We, re we talked to thousands, but we had actual input from over 1,000 people giving us the input on what that bond should look like, how big it should be, what it should cover. The board moved forward then with that, and that's what the measure is. And again, referring to the other side of that sheet, there is information on there for the uh, what was then, when they first started, a, a $298 million bond, but has since dropped to 291. I want to mention that because this is key for our district. The legislature in the last session, thanks to our elected officials, Carly in the room, uh, passed legislation to support school districts with bond measures with matching dollars. The largest possible award was $8 million. Uh, in May, a number of districts who had successful bond measures did reap the benefit of that. We applied for what is essentially a lottery, where one district out of 197, those going for bond measures were less. We were able to successfully win the lottery. So $8 million, the board determined to drop the amount of the bond, lower the tax rate, because the statewide, they're kicking in $8 million into our local measure. So that was, was really good news. A couple of other quick things, and boy, time flies when I see those little hints back there. I'm going to really let the paperwork speak for itself and let you ask questions, but I do want to make one comparison in terms of what I think sometimes is perspective of, of where we're at as the Gresham Barlow School District. We are the 10th largest school district in a state that has 197 school districts. So when you talk about our peers, those that are really in the game with us here, you're talking about Tiger Tualatin, Hillsborough, North Clackamas. What you're not talking about necessarily are those that don't scale with our community and our district, places like Estacada, Colton, Gaston. And yet when you look at the 25 districts that are in the Moulton, in the Tri-County metro area in terms of their tax rates, all in, operational cost and the bonds that the local voters have approved, out of those 25, we currently rank 20th with Estacada, with Colton, and with Gaston. If we were to be competitive in terms of our community's investments into schools, we would be up with Tiger Tualatin, Hillsboro, and North Clackamas. To get up there, this measure would put us there at ninth, not at first, not even at fifth. We would be ninth out of 25 if this tax measure is successful, this bond measure. So what we are asking the community to do is to invest locally. This is not a statewide measure. It's not 97, it's 98. It's local investment that will have impact here in jobs, in property values, but most importantly to me as an education leader, to the education those kids get in the buildings whether it be the technology that they need to compete with their peers across the state, or whether it be the spaces the teachers need in order to have comfortable, workable living environments. One quick example of, of what that's about, Gresham High School. A lot of graduates, I'm gonna, how many of you are actually Gresham High School graduates in here? It was old when John Maloney was there. <laughs> And it's getting older fast. It is not a worthwhile environment for students or teachers to have to operate. In this community, I don't believe, wants that for our students. And that's just one of 18 buildings. So uh, knowing the time is short, I'm actually going to let your questions direct anything else I might say. But I would again uh, reference the materials you have. One that, that has been a lot of people have paid attention to is if you understand when our buildings were built, you may have a greater appreciation for the facility needs that we have. And speaking of Gresham High School, 
World War I was when Gresham High School was built. Our only, this district is a unified district, has only built three buildings. Springwater Trail, Hogan Cedars, and partial investment in DeKalb. All of those other buildings were built by previous districts prior to unification. So our one successful bond measure, I think we have a pretty good track record of what we put on in front of the community and the success that those buildings have had in those schools. So with that, I'll take a deep breath and answer questions that you might have. Gotta be. <laughs> now, if the board member doesn't know the answer to this question, but no. <laughs> um, I am a board member. I have been on the Gresham Barlow School Board since we unified in 1994. I'll let you do the math. Um, I have been here from when we first unified and inherited a whole lot of bad buildings. Um, we call that bond the sticky, stinky bathroom, leaky roof bond because that's what it was. We spent all of our money just renovating the schools because we had just gotten out of safety, of the safety net thing, if you remember what all that was. We have, uh, the next bond was probably our most creative with, with Jim referencing that. We haven't had a bond since then, that's 16 years. I mean, stop and think about technology. What were you doing in 2000? Stop and think about all kinds of things that were new and revolutionary then that are out of date and not useful for training our kids. Technology is this community pushed really hard. That was one of the number one things they wanted in their school. The other one was safety, of course. And those are the two things we probably have focused the most interest, the most work, and the most money. And I can advocate here. <laughs> I'll ask a question that everybody else is thinking for the moment. As I recall, Jim, from um, listening to your presentation um, in another venue, the impact uh, of the bond measure is about a buck eighty-nine mm -hmm. per thousand. Right. Is that the right number? Yeah, dollar eighty-nine per thousand. So. Um, we can all do the math in terms of what our assessed valuations are and what that might cost us personally, uh, but perhaps you could speak a little bit to the economic impact uh, for the community and the region here um, for that kind of investment. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd be happy to. That dollar eighty-nine, by the way, uh, Multnomah County tells us that the average assessed value of homes in our tenants area is two hundred thousand dollars. It may not be your experience, but if that were the case, that's thirty-one fifty per month to put that into a kind of a number you can hopefully resonate with. The, the, the local impact, and I'll go outside of the educational impact, I think that's pretty obvious in terms of what, what is there, but in terms of local environment, I referenced in a previous meeting a study by Rutgers where you plug in the numbers of, of your uh, community's bond measure, school bond measure, and what does that mean to the larger community? And what it really means is you take that those millions of dollars and start looking at the number of jobs, for example, that would be provided. They estimated the calculations would be we'd have what we call 1,400 one-year jobs, the equivalent of, as a result of this bond. Now, the bond takes place in terms of the construction piece over three to five years, but if we can see there's a lot of jobs. And then there's the, the ripple effect of bringing that kinds of jobs, hopefully many of them local in terms of, of breaking bonds apart into small pieces so we can get lo local contractors to be a heavy part of this work. The ripple effect of those folks who are then either living or working or commuting into our community to work at 18 different sites. Now remember, this is a pretty large organization. We have over 1,000 employees, over 12,000 students, 18 different sites. When you have construction taking place at all of those locations in this community, the economic impact is great. And the one is someone who lives in the community that I also think is, is something that I would value is the increase in our own residential property values. It's pretty well known from the realtors in the room. Uh, we'll tell you that when you have well-functioning schools and while ours on the inside are doing a pretty darn good job, people are impacted by curb appeal or the lack thereof. And when a new facility is going in, one that can better serve the local community, those property values will increase, which then supports the commercial interest of the community. So we believe this is obviously a good educational choice, 
but it's also an incredible economic opportunity for this community. That's a long answer to your question, Brian. It's, it's a, Sorry about that. Question. Yeah. Actually, I just thought I'd have you clarify for us. Um, there's two schools that would be actually demolished and rebuilt, right? Yeah. And then um, our two high schools have um, significant, really, issues with them. But I believe every one of our elementary and middle schools are going to have safety features. Mm -hmm. Maybe just speak a minute. Sure. That helps remind me too as well. Okay. As, as Mike Schofield, who's on the board and I'm filling in for, uh, would tell you there's a chicken in every pot, uh, meaning that all 18 schools have significant work, primarily technology, safety and security, uh, classroom spaces throughout. But the six big projects, one way I guess I would capture those, are the two large high schools. Gresham is almost a 70% it's not even remodeled, but a lot of the parts rebuilt. Barlow, I would call a 70% remodel, meaning pretty much all parts of the building will be touched and improved. East Gresham Elementary and North Gresham Elementary would be replaced on site. There's enough space to build, then tear down. Uh, Deep Creek Damascus, uh, the Deep Creek Elementary building, currently leased to a charter, would be rebuilt to be a K-8, and they would move over there. And then the last impacted site is West Gresham Elementary would close as an educational facility. We've had considerable conversation with uh, local commercial interest and others who are certainly clear that, as we found out in a poll, the community values that building and that site, not necessarily as a school, but for its history, and there are plenty of opportunities for that to be then local use input from the community on where that building would go. To add to your comment on the economic impact in the town, uh, as a business owner, uh, today's freshmen, a handful of them in four to eight years, are going to be sitting in my office for a job interview. And um, I've found it to be much less expensive to hire the right person, a well-educated person, than to educate the wrong person. Yeah, very well said. And it's certainly, you know, relating back to what is it we need to do to get our high school kids through. One is providing good programs which take good space. You know, we, we've, we could face the, we won't, because we're going to be successful. But if Measure 98 were to pass and our bond was to fail, we would have more operating dollars for CTE than facility to house it. In other words, our metal shops that were built in the 70s don't match the manufacturing engineering programs that CTE demands today. And if we're going to be cutting edge CTE, we need capital investment. So that's part of our issue. Well, I think. Oh. oh. We're not done with you yet. We're not done. Okay. Well, actually, we might be, but because um, <laughs> this is just a statement. Uh, again, I, I am honored to, to chair the board of uh, the Gresham Barlow District with a very strong, collaborative, supportive uh, board team, all of which uh, are supporting this bond 100%. I uh, would like to invite everybody in the room. We're doing our bond campaign kickoff tonight at 7 o'clock at 3rd and Roberts. Sue, thanks for helping us get the spot. Um, again, it is a celebration, it is a motivational, uh, entertaining event uh, to get people out and knocking on the doors and doing what we knew, do need to do to pass this bond. And I really appreciate the support of the chamber um, in that uh, direction as well. And I uh, can never not speak without talking about public safety and just again want to resonate again with that. The importance of the security of our buildings for our students is huge. and. And it will also allow for um, our teachers to teach without fear, without being concerned about the safety of the kids, those sorts of things. It is all about um, public safety and prevention and uh, our, straight, our redesigned strong schools with all the right bells and whistles to keep our kids safe is our number one priority. Exactly. Um, the thing that I find probably the most exciting is the fact I feel right now the community is excited because of all the, the cool things that we are going to bring into our aging school. I'll just give a little example. My husband was in a grocery line over in Damascus now. Safeway's kind of our cent, um, city center as far as gathering and gossip and stuff. 
In the checkout line, he managed to talk three, four more people into voting for this bond. It's just information. And most of them, when they knew it was going to happen to Barlow, it was like, sign me up. So I think education is really important. And this is where we need you in your, in your jobs, in your community, in your churches. We have to get this word out. This is for our kids. You know, we've invested this for many, many years, a century with, Bar with uh, Gresham. But now is the time to step up and prepare our kids for the future. So I do have one quick closing note to make. I, I thanked Carla the, uh, for getting us the matching grants. I failed to see Representative Mark Johnson over here at the moment. And thank you as well uh, for the two of you for your leadership to put in that matching grant. I, that's $8 million that's collected from across the state coming into our local community if we are successful. And by the way, this is a use it or lose it. Uh, no future bond are we ever guaranteed to have a shot at that money, even if or whether it's even available. So this is a great opportunity. So thank you all very much. And we do have board members here to advocate like crazy. And uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. Thank you for the uh, presentations. Uh, very meaningful, very helpful to understand more about uh, M8098, rather, and the bond measure. Um, let me thank again our sponsors, Riverview Community Bank and Portland General Electric, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East uh, Community Media. Uh, don't forget to uh, stop on the way out to uh, check on the replay of this presentation. Um, and upcoming topics. So October, we're going to have our candidate forum, which we do every year. Uh, more about that to come. Uh, we have quite a list of uh, candidates who have uh, requested an opportunity to present at our forum. Uh, and in November, we'll have Ruth Miles from the state of Oregon. Uh, those who have heard her speak uh, in her presentations uh, will understand that uh, this will be a great, great uh, forum to attend. Lastly, please take a moment uh, to complete the evaluation forms on your seat. We really do read those, uh, take them to heart, um, and they help us a lot with our planning for future forums. Thanks again. Be safe. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>